I'm making taco meatloaf and as always I always go over the uh, utensils you need for uh, stuff like that I basically you need a uh, a large mixing bowl a loaf pan that, and, and that's pretty much it anything else you could just try to figure out for yourself and if you want uh, I can, cooking oil for that because you don't want the uh, meatloaf itself to actually stick to it and most importantly an oven <laughs> otherwise you won't be able to do shit with it okay now uh, here are some of the edible stuff you need ground beef it's uh, it's it's defrosted uh, breadcrumbs taco seasoning mix and eggs I think one egg is all I need, maybe even two, I'm not quite sure. See, eggs, here we go. Now, the very first step is to uh, put everything in the mixing bowl. The three main ingredients for any meatloaf are eggs, because it keeps it together, breadcrumbs, and ground, ground meat. You could even use ground turkey if you wish, if you wish. All right, now I'm gonna put it right here. All right, uh, this here's this here's the mixing bowl. All right. I have to take a few seconds to get the ground beef out of here. Okay, now. now what you do is you put the ground beef in here. Make sure the ground beef is defrosted or never frozen. Like in other words, uh, if you buy it on the same day, use it on the same day. Just put, keep it in the refrigerator. All right, now this gets dumped in here. Whenever you're dealing with uh, ground beef, you always, uh, and anything, any, any raw type of meat, you always wash your hands. This is what I'm doing. Sorry if you can't see me, uh, like I said, I'm washing my hands. Alright, there we are. Now. The reason why it doesn't look much like ground beef at this point in time is because I defrosted it in a pot full of water and when that happens the uh, the uh, blood from the uh, ground beef actually drains out. It's also good to have shredded cheese. Now. After you put the ground beef in the big mixing bowl, you uh, take the egg right here. Oh crap. Do this every time. Every time there's eggshells in it. I'm not good at this. Maybe I should learn. Okay, now. Shit, where did, where did it go? Where did it go? There, there it is. There it is. Come on, you. That's the one thing you don't want. You don't want eggshells in your food. Alright. 
If you want, you could actually uh, beat the egg before you put it in there, which is just fine. But, eh, it doesn't really make a difference. It's all going to get cooked up anyway. Okay, now. I think that'll be enough. Uh, maybe another egg, if, if anything. So, uh... I don't know. Alright, now, what you do is you add the taco seasoning mix next. Alright. Trying to make sure I'm... Alright, there it is. That's a little bit better. You sprinkle it all around. Actually, no, wait. You add the uh, breadcrumbs next. You just sprinkle them all around. That should be enough. Like so, this is what it should look like after you sprinkle the uh, breadcrumbs on. Maybe even a little bit more, who knows? Okay now. And a little more. Yeah. I think another egg would be good. Ah. No eggshells. It's been a long time since I had made a uh, meatloaf of any kind. Okay, now. Alright, now after you have had the, uh, after you put in the ground beef, the egg, and the breadcrumbs, you add in the taco seasoning mix. I'll just use a fork, I'll just use a pair of scissors. Right here, now. Mm. God, I love the smell of taco seasoning mix. I don't know what anyone else thinks, but I truly do love the smell of it. Now, here's the fun part. Now, after you uh, spread the uh, taco seasoning mix, it should look something like this. Now, it's usually like uh, one pack of taco seasoning mix per pound. But uh, you, if you want, you can add another, which uh, you know, I might as well do. Okay, now. Uh, I might as well add another, just in case. Now, hey, the more flavor you have, the better. All right, now what you do, I, right, I, right, yeah, I'm gonna add some shredded cheddar cheese, sharp cheddar. That's how I like it. In my opinion, the sharper the better. Oh, there. We go. Now the best thing I like about meatloaf is also the best thing I like about chili. After you add the three main ingredients, there is nothing that says you can't add a certain thing to it. Like, for example, the three main ingredients to meatloaf are ground meat, breadcrumbs, and eggs. Boom. You can add anything else you want. Shredded cheese, barbecue sauce, ketchup, Worcestershire sauce. You add um, sometimes anything like... Um, Alright, uh, you can add anything like... Uh, Anything else on it you want, you know, anything like Montreal steak seasoning, you can add garlic powder, you can add anything you want to it. It doesn't matter. It's what you like. In other words, it's versatile. Alright, now what you gotta do is you gotta get a good mix. You gotta get a good mix. My mother has this one thing where I get a machine that mixes it, but I prefer to do it with my hands. It's more fun that way. It's 
more interactive. Hold it. That's not looking as good because that spot doesn't look like it's as mixed up. Oh well. There we go. All right. Now, once you have mixed it together, you wash your hands again. Because, like I said, it is it is ground beef, and I'm dealing with raw eggs. Alright. Now, uh, after I wash my hands, I'm going to preheat the oven and just uh, fill up this uh, loaf pan. Now, now I don't know what to really heat up the oven to, maybe 350, something like that. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Alright, make sure there's nothing in the oven. Okay, now while the oven is heating up, you can put away the stuff that needs to be put away. Because it makes the cleanup a lot easier. Now, when you ever put away anything like one of those storage things, you compress as much air out of it, and, and then you seal it up completely. Because if it's something like this, you're golden. It's the air that makes things go bad. You don't want that. You want something else. Now, if you want, you take a big spoon like this. Actually, no. All right, um, here's something interesting. Now, uh, the finished product, before you put it into the uh, loaf pan, should look something like this. All right, now. Got to get a nice little saucer here. Now, you take the uh, cooking spray. And you spray the hell out of it. And now you dump and and now and now you just spoon it in like so. It's not gonna mount out too much. This is a pretty big loaf pan. I should have got a smaller one. That's right, that's fine, that's fine. It's all cool. It's all cool. Make sure you try to even it out as much as possible. That's that. There's the key. You try to even it out as much as possible. Maybe I should have used two pounds of ground beef. Oh well. It even smells good before you even cook it. Whoops! Sorry.
All right, now. The idea of evening it out is make sure it cooks even. It'll cook a lot better once it's cooked even. Once it is cooked even, you're in like steam. I don't know. My stupid arm. All right, now you gotta put this stuff away because that way the cleanup will be easier a little bit later. I'm just getting to fix myself a glass of iced tea right now. Okay, now. Now, when it's in the when it's in the loaf pan, it should look something like this. And uh, trust me, this stuff is good. First time I made meatloaf, uh, taco meatloaf that is, I, I made the mistake of not putting any breadcrumbs in it. So basically, it didn't even fill up the entire pan. It, it, and it was all condensed. It was all just pure ground beef and mixed with taco seasoning mix. It still tasted great, but I just, you gotta put breadcrumbs into it too. Alright. Alright. 314. 315. Alright, the oven's almost preheated. It's it's really easy to do. I mean, Add the three main ingredients, then the taco seasoning mix, and then whatever else you want. Some people, you could actually add salsa. Mix a little bit of salsa in there, and no, it's you're golden. But I really don't, like, I'm, I haven't tried it, I and mean, it doesn't sound bad. Eh, next time, I'll try it. But I added shredded cheese into it. Yeah, um, and, and that's uh, pretty much it. The uh, oven's almost preheated. It's at uh, 337 right now. And uh, I preheated it to 350 degrees. Uh, I'll show you a view of it once again. Like once it's all completed and mixed in, that's what it should look like. Before it goes into the oven. 343, 344. Alright. wonder why I can't write anything in my own chat. Hmm, I used to be able to. Maybe I'm doing this wrong. Alright, now that the oven's preheated, I'm going to see if I can... Whoops, sorry. Uh, wrong camera. Alright, uh, that's my towel. Alright. Right there. Now, take this. But it doesn't matter top rack or bottom rack, it doesn't really matter. Just put it in there. Give it <laughs> Alright, I started at 447, probably about a half hour. So it'd be 517. Five seventeen, yeah, something like that. Um until then you can just you can just uh, hang out and have fun. Uh, <sighs> I could show you guys my chest set. While while we're waiting, uh, I've got to make sure that this is, this table is cleaned off. Like um, when it's in the oven, it's good to clean up afterwards because that way it makes things a lot easier. It's kind of like multitask. The stuff's in the oven, you clean up. Hmm. Ah, here we go. 
When all else fails, this will help you clean up your counter or anything like that if you have a spill. It is, it's pretty much an antibacterial thing, antibiotic thing or whatever. Spilled a couple of uh, cracked eggs. They get eggshells on there, so. All right. All right, I'll be back in just a few minutes. While the stuff's cooking in the oven, I might as well show you guys my chest set. It's, uh, it's made by Excalibur. It's, uh, like if you've seen a movie called Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, you'll, you'll recognize this chest set almost immediately. All right, all right here's the rook. It's called the Excalibur Chess Gear. Uh, all right, here we go. There we go. Ah, oh, crap. Uh, all right. All right, sorry, it's not focusing. But yeah, this is called the Excalibur Chess Gear Chess Set. It's my favorite tournament chess set. The pieces are triple weighted. Perfect. I'll put it right in front of my face. And uh, the look and the design of the pieces are great. It's made out of different material than the regular tournament sets. You know what? I'll bring I'll, I'll bring out my other set just to give you to show you an example. Okay, now, I'll be with you in just a quick sec. I got the bishop, uh, the, the knight and the rook, king and queen. Now, these are your average tournament chess pieces you see in the tournaments of today. Now, I'm going to compare this to its counterpart of the other chess set that I have. Okay, for example, all right, I'll start with the king, if I can find it. I know it's here someplace. All right, all right here we are. All right, notice the difference in the pieces. The uh, cr the uh, crosses on top are, are different. It's supposed to be like more like an angel. Uh, it's made out of a different material. You can obviously tell. The design of the king's different. All right. The queen's comp the queen is very different. Like uh, the top, you can see like what's going on at the top. You can't really do that unless I focus in and on it. Right here, it's uh, the queen's a little bit taller than the uh, regular pa plastic pieces, but I just like this design better. Right. Oops, wrong one. All right, now the rook. That this shows some differences. I know. Okay, right here. Right here is the rook. Okay, now. Right here is the rook. The, obviously, the uh, the piece for the Excalibur is much bigger. And obviously, much different. Like, the towers go up a little higher. And everything. It just I just like this design so much better. Everything about it is just awesome. Now, the knights. The knight is fatter. It has a completely different design. Whoops, sorry. Alright. Yeah, it's definitely wider. Alright. 
the bishops are fatter and they're whiter the better they feel better I mean they just look so much cooler I think sorry sorry if it's not focusing right all right there it is yeah like this is your normal tournament set this is the Excalibur I prefer this over this however I like this because it's triple weighted this is my backup set now the pawns a huge difference okay now pawn from the Excalibur Pawn from the regular chess set. You can see like a huge difference in between. Sorry if it's not focusing. I really don't know how to fix that. But like yeah. Like yeah, this is one reason why I like it. It's just it's sturdier. It feels like it's made better. Stuff like that. And I prefer the Excalibur over the regular tournament set any day. But it's always good to have a backup set. Alright. Okay, now. now I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. Oh no, not yet. All right, um, I put it in the oven at 447. Um, see, now 15 minutes from there would be 457, 502. 502, I will take it out. Um, let me see now. Um, if you're wondering what else I I make, uh, I can make uh, iced tea on on the IRL stream. I can make uh, see a mac and cheese taco. Oh boy, sorry about that, guys. There's a I have an incoming call. I'm I'm not gonna worry about it. What you wonder? You wonder what's so funny? The least used uh, feature on my uh, phone is the phone. <laughs> because you see, I use data. I use uh, the text messaging. I use the camera. I barely make a call. Like, uh, last time I made a call on my phone, a couple days ago. Last time I text, 20 minutes. <laughs> last time I used uh, Facebook Messenger, a couple hours ago. Oh, boy. Now, the, see, this is the uh, most boring part of it, the waiting. So I might as well try to do something. I might as well set up this board right here and uh, show you guys some interesting tricks. Alright, I'm going to put this one away. Alright, I'm, I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. Alright, now. There's this there's the board. It rolls out. Gotta get myself a a clock. There's only one there's really only one clock that goes well with this. Is the uh, Excalibur Game Time 2. going to set up my board here. Alright. I'm going to set up the board. I'll show you a couple of tricks and a couple traps and stuff like that. Streaming at the current time. Da, 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 da. Some of them are dull. Maybe I need to polish them up a bit. And some of them are a little bit shinier.
Alright. I like to play the French defense. I like to play against it. You know, it's fun. It's just a solid opening. I'll show you what I do and why. Alright. This is my uh, tournament set. Like the French defense advanced variation. E4, E6, D4, D5, E5. And black usually replies with C5. Believe it or not, you could actually transpose this into this position from the Alapin Sicilian. Alright, now. C3. Now, if if he plays knight c6, I usually play bishop b3 because now that bishop is defending it as well as the pawn. Now, he'll move this queen out to b6. I move my queen to d2 because now b2, c3, d4 are all protected. Now, let's say he moves his knight g to e7. I move my knight out to f3. Now he moves his knight out to f5 because now he's uh, introducing a third attacker. Onto this pawn, uh, one, two, fourth attacker on this pawn. One, two, three, four. I have one, two, three, four defending it. So if you have the same amount of attackers as your opponent does defenders, your attack will fail. That's one thing to know. So, I right, one time online, this is about last year sometime, I decided to set a trap with this, bishop d3. He, he falls for it. c takes d4. c takes d4. He decides to move the bishop out here. Try the pin. All right, fine. He does knight takes d4. I play knight takes d4. Bishop takes d4. Queen takes d4. Whoops. I'm supposed to take. Oh, sorry. Uh, I messed that. I messed that move order up. Sorry. Uh. All right, right here. Now, knight takes right. Knight takes, that's how it goes. Knight takes d4, bishop takes d4. Now, queen takes d4. You know what's so funny about that? See how his king is on this diagonal? See how his queen's undefended? This is the trap that I set. Bishop b5 check. Now, let's say he plays bishop d7, which is what well, actually he played. Queen takes d4. Boom, I got his queen. It's one trap, you know, that's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the traps. Uh, Alright, now I gotta go check on the meatloaf. Alright, uh, oops, sorry, my bad. Alright, right here. Plate. Saucer. And a fork. Just in case if I need it. And you would need one of these. A glove. Ooh, it's looking good. Woohoo! I gotta show you this. I mean, it's looking good, but not done yet. I can tell already. It is not done yet. Oh, it's looking good. Mm. Alright, now that I just checked on it, uh, I think it needs about 15 more minutes, maybe even 14, all depending on the time. All right, now I'm going to show you a simple chess end game. The king and the rook versus the king. The idea is just to get the king to either this square or this square or just at least on this back rank. Now, there are a couple different methods. The, the, as long as you get the, uh, the same basic overall structure, you should be fine. Now, I would play king f2, which forces his king to go to d3, d4. You can move the rook to e3, or you can move the king to e2. Let's say you move king to e2. He pushes his king to e4, because he's trying to keep his king as centralized as possible. You move your rook back. He moves his king to d4. 
You move your king to d2, because now his king cannot move to c3, d3, or e3. He moves his king back to e2. Now you move your rook to f2. Now, this is where the forward progress has been made. After he moves his king to d4, because keeping in these four squares, you move your rook to f4. Check. You move your king here because you're attacking the rook. Now you move your king to e3 to defend the rook. King d5, rook e4, say he goes king c5, rook d4, because now black's king is limited to just these 12 squares. So uh, now king b5, king d3, king c5, king c3, king b5, king b3, king c5. Rook d1, king b5, now, rook d5 check, king c6, king c4, king b6, now you put your king to b, b4, because now you're preventing his king from moving to a5, b5, and c5. Now he moves his king to c5 to try to attack the rook. You, move, you can move your rook anywhere along this diagonal as long as it's I mean, on this file, as long as it's d4, d3, d2, or d1. So now, as he moves his king back to b6, move your rook to d6 now, deliver and check. Now, you have limited him to just d6 squares. c8, a, b8, a, a8, a, a7, b7, c7. Now, bam, you move your king to b5. Oh, no, c5, c5. He moves his king to b7. You move your king to c6. He moves his king to uh, a7. Uh, yeah, b, yeah, b7, a7. Now you move your rook to b6 because now you just limit him to these two squares. That is all you need. Now, king a8, king c6, king a7, king b7. Now he has no choice but then to go to a8. Now, checkmate. Now, sometimes, like when you usually promote your pawn, it's a good idea, most of the time, you get promoted to a queen. But there are some times when promoting your pawn to a queen is a bad idea. Like, for example, this one right here. If white to move and promotes his pawn to a queen, it is a stalemate because it's black's move. He can't move here. He can't move to b8 because the queen has it. He can't move to b7 because the queen and the king have it. He can't move his king to uh, b6 because the king has that. He can't move his king to a6 because the queen has that. So, c8 equals queen. I'll call that a question mark. Really, you can't really call that a blunder because... Maybe, I don't know. But what you do is you uh, promote the pawn to a rook. He is now, the king cannot move to a8, b8, b7... B6, so his only move is king to A6, and now watch. Checkmate, boom. All right, there's uh, ten. All right, there's ten minutes left on the. Uh, now there's ten minutes left on the uh, the meatloaf, and I'm just going over chess games so that way it's not boring. <laughs> okay, now, now I'm gonna go over, over another end game. All right. Two bishop checkmate. The idea is that, all right, now the thing to remember, well, actually, one of the ideas is with the king over here or over here. Now, yeah, the bishops work best when they are right next to each other. So, all right, bishop e7, king d4, bishop, I mean, sorry, bishop e2, king d4, bishop d2. Now, if he goes king e4, you bring your king to f2. Now you're creating a five square wall that his king cannot pass. Well, he goes king d4. You bring your king to f3 because you're just trying to gain as much space as possible. Let's say he goes king uh, e4. You do king e5. Sorry, you bishop e3. And now you're building a wall. King d5. Bishop d3. That's because the reason why you're still creating that wall that his king cannot pass. Now. King e5, here's what you do. You gotta you gotta push him back. So how you do that is you uh, bring your bishop to e4. 
is he can't take the bishop because the king has it. He can't move to d4 or f4 because the bishop has it. He can't move his king to d5 or f5 because the bishop has it. The light square bishop. So he moves his king to e6. Now, once he does, once he does, once he does that, you move your bishop to d4 right here. He moves his king to uh, d6. Now, move your king to f4. Moves his king to e6. You move your bishop to e5 because now you're pushing him further back. All right, now let's say he goes king d7. You put you still push your bishop to uh, d5 because now this four square wall he cannot pass. King e7 because you're trying to keep your king as centralized as possible. Now what you do is you move your king to f6. He moves his king to d8 now. You move your bishop to e6 because now that four square wall is created but with the king and the bishop. Now, if he moves his king to e8, it wouldn't be a bad idea to move here. But it would be a better idea to move bishop c7 because now you're creating not just a wall but a corner. d8, d7, e7, f7. So, so he's forced to move that way. So king f8, bishop d7. King G8, because he's going to try to escape out here. But, nope, that's not going to work. King F8, Bishop D6, check. Because now, the the uh, the corner is still created. E8, E7, F7, G7. So, G8 is his only move. Bishop B6, check. It's the same thing. Now, the corner is F8, F7, G7, H7. While he's delivering the check. So, his only move is King to H8. Now... You play bishop e5, checkmate. And and that's how the devil bishop checkmate works. Seems pretty simple enough. Now I will go over a queen versus a seventh rank d pawn. Alright, I'm gonna make it as difficult as possible. But as long as you remember the uh, the pattern, you should be fine. Now, notice that the queen's on h8, the white king's on a8, the black pawn's on d2, and the white king is on c2. The, the black pawn has one move to uh, promote to a queen and draw the game. So, you don't want that. The idea is to get the king behind the pawn, or no, in front of the pawn. That way you can move your king upward. So, all right, now... Queen c3 is out of the question because king takes. So now this is the reason why I put the queen at h8. Now what you do is you put your queen to c8 to deliver check. He goes king d3. Now queen d7 check. King e2. Queen e6 check because you're inching your way closer to the king. Now he puts his king back to d3. Now you uh, move your queen to d5 check. He moves his king to c2. Now, you move your queen to c4, check, because you're trying to cut off the communication between the king and the pawn. Now, he moves his king to b8, because he's just trying to promote. Now, you, when that happens, you move your queen to d3. Sorry, he moves his king to b1, not b8. You move your queen to d3 to deliver check and to attack the pawn. Now, once his king goes to c1, because obviously he wants to promote, you move your queen to c3, check. If he moves his king to b8, queen takes d2, so he can't do that. Now, once the king's at d1, you bring the king to b7. You bring that king to b7. Now, you're going to still try to promote the pawn with king e2. Well, now you move your queen to e5, check. King d3, queen d5, king e2. But now it's different because it's white's move instead of black's move. Now, you move your... Queen to e4, check. King f1. Queen d3, check. King e1. Queen e3, check. King d1. Now that his pawn cannot move, and it's white's move, you move your king to c6, because now you're getting your king closer. You can't make checkmate with just the queen alone. That's impossible. That can't happen. So now, he moves his king to c2. 
and now you repeat the process over and over again. All right, queen c5 check, king d3, queen d5 check, king c2, queen c4 check, king b1. Um, let me see now, uh, queen d3 check, king c1, queen c3 check, king d1, king d5, king e2, queen e5 check, king d3, because you're trying to do everything you can to promote this pawn, queen d4 check, king e2, now, queen e4 check, queen, uh, king f1, queen d3 check, king e1, <clears throat> queen e3 check, King D1. King D4. Now, the thing to do here is figure out which square is the best square to move the queen to check the black king. If you move it here, the king has C1. So now, what you do is you move your queen to C3. Because if you move it here, queen takes D2, wins. Alright, now his best chance is to go right here. Now, you can move your king here if you wish. But king e3 is a little bit better of a move because, because once the king moves over here, because, all right, the king cannot move to c1 because the queen. King cannot move to c2 because the queen. King cannot move to e2 because the king. King cannot take his own piece. So he moves king e1. Queen takes d2 check. King f1. Queen f2 checkmate. All right. The uh, taco meatloaf is almost ready. It's almost ready for testing. Stuff like that. It's like, uh, that, and that is pretty much it. Just get the king in front of the D. If it's, I know, if it's a, a B, D, G, a B, D, E, or G pawn, this position is a win for white as long as it's uh, white's move. If it's an A, C, F, or H pawn, then the position is a draw. The best thing I could do is just practice it until you know it. Okay, here's a funny... Uh, all right. I was ready to resign this game until I saw a way to wipe the smile off my opponent's face. I mean, like I like I had to sacrifice a lot of material just to not be checkmated in this game. White to move. Oops, sorry. White to move. Checkmate in two. Like I saw a smile on the guy's face. I go, oh wait a minute. I was about. I was ready to resign. I'm like, wait a minute. Bishop f6 check. <laughs> so now his bishop's right next to it. His king's pretty much in. Queen G7. Now, this is what's called the ultimate bit slap of chess. Ace takes G7 checkmate. Boom. <laughs> I checkmated him with the pawn. I'm trying to remember how I got to that position. I didn't even write it down at the time, but it was pretty funny. Alright, now I'm going to check on the meatloaf. Alright, uh, bingo, perfect. Yeah, I think I kind of messed that up. It's not even slicing up like meatloaf should. Maybe the cheese put it over the top. Alright, the meatloaf's almost done. Say about another five minutes. All 
Alright. Now, they always say rooks belong behind past pawns. Oh, no, but, but not in front of them. But there are also a few things to remember. All right, let's say the king's over here. Now, let's just say you're 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 playing as black, and I don't know. You had this rook. I don't know. Rook right over here. Now watch. See, one of the things to remember as black is don't put your king to c7. Or anywhere along days. Because. Actually no. Uh, don't. Yeah that's right. Don't put your king on the uh, third rank or higher. And don't put your king. On c7, d7, e7. Or like yeah. On these three squares. If you can get your king over here. You're perfectly fine. But here's the point. The reason why, now watch, uh, all right, let's just say it's Black's move, he plays King C6. Now, what you do is you take your Rook and deliver a check on C8, say he goes King D7, bam, H8 equals Queen. Now, let's just say, all right, um, it's Black's move, and he plays King C7. What you do is you bring your Rook over to H8, right here. And it doesn't matter or something. He's going to lose material. So right, let's say he plays this. Rook takes h7. Bam. Rook a7. Skewer. King d6. Rook takes. That's the reason why that you keep your king on the b7 and a7 squares. Oops. Wrong one. Because it doesn't matter what he does now. Alright. Uh, let me see. Now, this... Because I... As soon as that rook moves, rook takes pawn. Unless you deliver check somehow, which doesn't involve the rook going right here or right here. Alright. Alright, yeah, um... Alright, I'm gonna get a nice spatula. Not that one. Now where are the spatulas? By the way, it's smelling really, really good. Oh boy. Um, hmm. Where the hell are the spatulas? We don't tell me they're in the dishwasher. All right, got a spatula. Okay, now, now I'm going to check on the meatloaf again. I'm going to give it a little test. All right, just uh, give me a second. And hold it right there. Meatloaf is done. Takes about 35 minutes in the oven at 350. Hey, 3535. Three, Interesting. Uh, I don't think there's be enough in there. Oh, well. Alright, but I'm going to show you what the finished product will look like. That's what, that's what the finished product will look like. A nice, good meatloaf. I know it's not thick enough, but that's because I only use one pound of ground beef, but 
Uh, this is just to show how it's done. Now, I think I used too many eggs. Uh, I think I'm supposed to use only one instead of two. Oh my god, it's good. Alright, well, I want to thank everyone for coming out. And, um, I appreciate it. Uh, I know there was a couple people... Uh, a few times that I came out. I saw, like, two viewers, three viewers, one viewer, zero, one, and stuff like that. Well, and, uh, catch me a little later. I'm going to be streaming, um... Uh, Call of Duty Black Ops Team Deathmatch. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Alright, see you guys later. Bye.